Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. My name is Corey Olson, the Tolkien Professor, and this is session number 215 of Exploring the Lord of the Rings, our sixth session in which we are talking about Bilbo's six stands of poem. I feel confident we're going to finish that up today, though perhaps I shouldn't say that as we didn't quite finish our discussion of stanza five last time. So, But here's hoping that we will make it all the way through the last stanza to the end of the poem this time. And then next time we'll be thinking about the context a little bit. But um, uh, awesome. So uh, it's been... Um, uh, there has been a lot uh, that has been going on. I definitely wanted to... Um, draw people's attention. It is the week before it's the last week of January right now, which means we are starting a new set of space modules in February. So wanted to draw people's attention to that. Uh, if you go to signumuniversity.org slash space, you can find, um, uh, you can find all of our uh, uh, upcoming modules that are beginning in February, uh, as well as the candidate modules for March. Uh, we're going to be uh, looking to be doing some uh, lots more fun stuff coming up soon. And I've just been talking with some folks about some new modules that we're going to be offering uh, in April and moving forward. So we have a lot of things happening in space. Space is uh, our adult continuing education uh, sector. This is uh, the place where you can go to learn awesome stuff in a really low key, low pressure environment, um, but still with uh, in uh, you know, a class full of uh, cool people uh, and with really awesome teachers. So that is uh, uh, that is our space program, and I definitely encourage you to uh, to look into that. It has been really really fun. Um, so um, anyway, that is uh, 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 one other thing. Quickly, I wanted to uh, share with you guys. I just got an invitation this week that I thought you guys might be interested in. Um, I'm going to do a, a guest spot uh, on the uh, Fellowship Onion podcast with Dominic Monaghan and Billy Boyd uh, in a few weeks. I don't know exactly when the episode's going to air, maybe end of uh, February or something like that. Uh, but they invited me to come on the show. We're going to record it in two weeks, something like that. So anyway, it, it should be fun. Um, it's... <laughs> Sounds like they're following up from when Colbert was a guest and mentioned exploring the Lord of the Rings. So I'm sure they're going to have some questions for me about exploring the Lord of the Rings. Uh, so uh, I'll be trying to represent uh, our discussion here uh, when we get to the Friendship Onion. So that'll be fun. Um, anyway, so uh, it's uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be because I just wanted to share share that with you guys because we'll probably be talking about you guys, uh, you know, in the episode. So uh, that that that'll be uh, that'll be fun. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so let us jump back to the text. Oh, well, actually, wait, quickly before we do. Um, many thanks to those of you who have gotten involved in our web project already. Uh, there have been some really great discussions that have been happening uh, on our discussion board. And I wanted to, you know, uh, if people still want to get involved in, in our you know, the early stages of the formation of our Exploring the Lord of the Rings web project uh, as we work not only to archive all of the ideas that we've had and the stuff that we've done um, over the years, but also uh, to be building, you know, a place where people can come and ask questions and uh, and find information and stuff. So um, definitely wanted to, uh, uh, to thank those of you who have jumped in and gotten involved already. Uh, and uh, uh, that's really great. So I know we're looking for... Um, we're probably going to need somebody who is, you know, Jenny and I were talking about this, going to need to be finding somebody who can really be a point person, especially on the for the tech side of things, because we're going to need to coordinate with our Signum folks, uh, you know, about how we can the some questions, right, that are going to need to be answered as far as, you know, hosting issues and stuff like that. Um, so um, uh, anyway, that's... Um, uh, uh, anyone who is interested in kind of serving as the, the sort of liaison, um, you don't necessarily have to like do the bulk of the work, obviously, uh, for the tech development. But if you are involved in those tech conversations and are interested in maybe kind of being the liaison uh, and, and kind of the point person on that, that'd be really cool so that we could uh, sort of move things forward in a more, uh, uh, in a, in a, uh, uh, regular way there for uh for the 
beginning stages of the pro of the project. So um, anyway, uh, that is the last thing that I wanted to say before we get back to the text. So let's get back to the poem. And as usual, I'm going to go through from the start. And this time we're going to read the whole poem. Right. And then I'll kind of review where we've been and, and uh, finish up. As I think there are a couple things I still wanted to say about stanza five that I think I was holding back at the end of last time. And then we'll get to stanza six, which brings up a shocking shift. There's a shocking change that happens in stanza six. I sit beside the fire and think of all that I have seen, of meadow flowers and butterflies in summers that have been of yellow leaves and gossamer in autumns that there were, with morning mist and silver sun and wind upon my hair. I sit beside the fire and think of how the world will be when winter comes without a spring that I shall ever see. For still there are so many things that I have never seen. In every wood, in every spring, there is a different green. I sit beside the fire and think of people long ago, and people who will see a world that I shall never know. But all the while I sit and think of times there were before, I listen for returning feet and voices at the door. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, interesting. A bunch of things that I'm seeing right there after just reading it... Uh, uh, reading it through there, but let's let's go back quick. Um, so remember the overall shape, right? And then we've been looking at the overall shape in several different kind of dimensions. We were looking at the set, of course. the The biggest picture pattern that is most clear is the repeated line, right? I sit beside the fire and think. It stands a one stands of three, and then again in stands of five. So we seem to have, and that seems to establish the shape from the beginning of three pairs of stanzas, right? One and two, three and four, four and five, uh, uh, sort of kicked off by that repeated line, I sit beside the fire and think. Um, so we get three movements, right? Three things that he's sitting beside the fire and thinking. And when we go back and look over what we've discussed, we saw that the very first pair, right, stands as one and two, and we saw the intimate connections between those two and the way that they symmetrically came together, right? Um, they are, we have the celebration of summer and of autumn. And of course, we were noticing how he was only a spectator and barely involved, right? He's not singing about himself. These are, they are his memories, but they're not memories about him. Uh, summers and the autumns, those are the, um, they're the heroes, right? Essentially, um, of those, um, of those two stanzas. Stanza three, we had the shift in tense, the shift in tense from the, uh, the simple past, in stanza two, um, but also very importantly, as we discussed, the f the present perfect, right? An action which is completed in the present time there in the first stanza, uh, which seems really important. Again, the, um, uh, the present perfect is a fascinating tense, um, an action that is completed right now as you are, you are declaring the action done, essentially, uh, when you are, uh, when you're saying it, when you utter something in the present perfect. Um, and, um, and that action, which was being declared complete, is his seeing all the things that he has seen uh, to this point. Um, whereas in stanza three, we shifted to the future. He is beginning to think of how the world will be when winter comes without a spring that I shall ever see. And then we noted in stanza four, the shift back to the present perfect. Um, and that really um, uh, was a powerful move, right? That he's no longer talking about the future there when he's saying, for still there are so many things that I have never seen. Um, he's not just speaking with a kind of despair about the future, right? About the things that he hasn't seen. Um, he's talking about the things that he has never seen um, with at least the potential. One possible way to read that, as we were discussing, is with a sort of implied yet uh, that there seems to be hope and even, in a sense, faith involved there. 
in every wood, in every green spring, there is a different green. Um, that is a statement of fact. It's not an observation, right? He's not talking about stuff that he has seen there uh, in those two lines. Indeed, the syntax of the lines suggests this is what he has never seen, colon, right? In every wood, in every spring, there is a different green. But that statement in itself, in every wood, in every spring, there is a different green. That statement about the uniqueness of spring, about the repetition of spring, about the perpetuity, right, of the repetition of spring, um, is, uh, is, is that's, that's the statement of hope, right? He's not talking about, it's, he's not talking about an end, even if he's thinking in some sense about his own end. He's not thinking about endings, exactly. Um, just as the springs and the summers and the falls happened, and he was just there to see them, so the springs are going to carry on happening. Um, then in stanza five, last time, we had the first very significant shift, where he's sitting beside the fire and thinking again, but what he's thinking of now is of people long ago. And we talked about people, we talked about the word people and the sound of the word people, um, and how that... Um, how explosive those peas are and how that word kind of jumps out at you repeated twice very close together there. And we had the two categories of people, people long ago and people who will see a world that I shall never know. Um, we were linking that back to stanza three with him thinking of how the world will be when winter comes without a spring that I shall ever see. Um, but the question that I feel that I didn't get a chance to, fin to finish with didn't get a chance to answer, is the knowing, is the knowing. Um, we spoke of how striking, like we established the fact that it's really important that he ch goes from seeing to knowing. And we talked about how the verb see, the verb to see, has been one of the dominant words of the entire poem so far, how it's been central to the the primary rhyme um, in almost every stanza along the way, not number two, but in every other stanza. Um, and he shifts from seeing, or I have seen, uh, to I shall never know in that last line. People who will see a world that I shall never know. Um, more, I want to talk more here about the significance of that, the culmination of the fifth stanza with the word no, the changeover to the word no. Um, also, going back and looking, right, we had seen in line two of stanza one. We were looking at this last time, but I wanted to refresh my memory. Seen in, 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 in line two, see in line four of stanza three, and then seen again in stanza, in line two of stanza four. Um, and now no, so like if we're kind of alternating against, we're skipping two, but if we're sort of alternating there, it's time for seen to be at the end again, but instead it's, it's no. And once again, will, who will see a world that I shall never know is of course directly linked back to, um, how the world will be when winter comes without a spring that I shall ever see. Right. Um, what do you guys think about the difference? The significance of, of knowing as opposed to seeing. Um, now I agree, Nancy, that no doesn't necessarily mean knowledge, not necessarily mean knowledge in the sense of academic knowledge, right? Um, it very likely, uh, he's sort of thinking more of an experiential kind of, 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 of knowledge there. Um, that's very likely. Um, oh, that's really interesting, Matt. It's very, it's a very Shakespearean observation. Um, that is the audible association between the word no, K-N-O-W, and the word no, N-O. Um, uh, boy, does Shakespeare love to play on those two words, no and no. Um, uh, Yes. Yeah. Uh, it makes me think of Richard III. But um, anyway, yeah, yeah. I, interesting. Um, so Matt is thinking about the way that we shift to the negation 
there that I shall never know, which is a, a, a really strong statement. I shall never know. Um, and we talked about will and shall. We talked about that last time. Um, uh, yeah. Um, Blood, that's interesting that... Um, Okay, so we got a, a couple observations about the knowing versus the seeing. Um, Blah the Inspirer was saying that uh, we uh, knowing more strongly suggests he will no longer be here. See could just mean that he's sitting in Rivendell, not going anywhere, right? Um, I mean, yeah, to to uh, to not see the spring might just mean you don't get out that often, right? Uh, potentially, right? So where's th that I shall never know? Like n not in any sense, n not in any way. And Drow Snake, this kind of connects to your talking about how knowing can open up other avenues, like other, even other sensory avenues, right? Um, you know, to know something is more than just to see it. Um, um, but of course, it also means that you can come to know it uh, in other ways. You don't have to experience it firsthand in order to know it, right? Um, um, so connecting that kind of broader experience through knowledge, or as knowledge, I guess, um, th with the negative does um, uh, is uh, more kind of complete uh, in that way, um, and um, yes. And the last thing I wanted to point out was um, uh, music out pointing that like it's uh, the the difference between experiencing something like the knowledge as again that sort of experiential knowledge compared with mere observation right and music I, I'm, I'm reminded uh, uh, as you're suggesting there I think of the way in which in those early stanzas it is so purely observational again he's there he's witnessing the springs and the autumn but he's not a he's not a player right he's not an actor he's not thinking about himself at any point right he's still not thinking of himself, even though he's talking about what he, um, you know, uh, of all that I have seen, it doesn't revolve around him, right? Um, and now there's this kind of deeper negation in the future, right? I shall never know. I won't even. I won't even hear about it, right? I won't even hear about it. Um, people who will see a world that I shall never know. Um, And um, it, it seems to me, um, it seems to me important the rhyme here is important. We talked about the rhyme, how he's doing this big O rhyme here, which has never happened in the poem, and it's very noticeable. It's very almost startling to the ears to have this big O rhyme here. And you'll notice the effect of the O rhyme is the linking of the words no and a go. And no in that future context. I shall never know that negative future context, right? Um, people long ago and people who will see a world that I shall never know. The rhyme connects the past and the future, right? And when I say it linked them, it doesn't like equate them, right? Um, I mean, on the one he he does know people long ago, in some sense, right? Actually, that's kind of an interesting example of how you can know something without seeing it, right? He didn't see Baron and Luthien, but he knows, in some sense, he knows Baron and Luthien. He knows their story. He knows A. Arendel well enough to write the poem about him. Right. Um, but he's never seen A. Arendel except, I guess, from a very long distance indeed. Um, but um, so he thinks of people long ago, comma, and people who will see a world that I shall never know. We talked about the way that this that stanza divides itself in half again. Um, but instead of just setting out a list of things that he's thinking about, we, we have the we have the, the split into two. Right. There are these two groups of people, people long ago and people who will see a world that I shall never know. Um, the people unknown to him, but also the people who are known to him, the people who are going to outlive him. Right. Um, long ago people and present day people, but 
but but the people who are going to outlive me, who are going to see the world that I shall never know, um, that world of the future. Um, and Lady Lakata, you're perfectly right. Um, there are lots of people from long ago that he can go down and have breakfast with at Rivendell, right? Um, when you're at Rivendell, long ago is a big phrase, right? I mean, it covers a lot of ground uh, at uh, at Rivendell. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I wonder... I wonder if War Eagle, um, the people he's writing about, um, and the people who are a part of the future he has changed, the future that he has been a part of. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is interesting because I mean, I, I, I was just talking about Arendel, right? I mean, Bilbo as not only a, a a listener of stories in Rivendell, but a but a writer. Of stories, the transmitter of stories. We t we've talked about Bilbo's position as this, um, you know, the more or less self-conscious kind of caretaker and um, perpetuator, right, of the old stories and the old world into the new world, right? I mean, um, what's going to be his final legacy, Bilbo's final legacy, his translations from the Elvish, right? Um, and um, uh that's in the first draft, and I still love this. There's, I, I have a fairly short list of things that uh, Tolkien put in the first draft of The Lord of the Rings and took out, and I wish he hadn't. Um, I'm mostly okay with most of the things that he took out of the early drafts of The Lord of the Rings, but one of the things that I miss, um, uh, one of the things that I miss is... Um, the fact that in the first draft, when Frodo and Sam and Merry and Pippin leave Rivendell after they come back from Gondor, right at the end of the Return of the King, um, when they leave Rivendell to, to turn for the Shire, Bilbo gives Sam his translations from the Elvish. Uh, and I, um, I think that's awesome. I love that uh, in so many ways. But... Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> Fort Thoughtless says, hashtag bring back Odo. No, Odo is not the number one thing that I miss from the drafts. Uh, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay with letting Odo rest in peace. His posterity is preserved uh, by the fact that most of his lines are still in the text. <laughs> but anyway. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, that was another thing I was going to say about I Shall Never Know, but I can't remember it now. Well, I'm sure we'll come back to it. So let's go on to the sixth stanza. Um, but all the while I sit and think of times there were before, I listen for returning feet and voices at the door. Okay. Um, first, where do we start? Rhythm. But all the while I sit and think of times there were before, I listen for returning feet and voices at the door. Rhythm. Still perfect. I still almost flawless I am's. The place that I... Not quite trip, but one of the first things that I notice is the very first syllable. The but. Um, uh, the but. The but's pretty strong. But is a strong consonant to start with, right? Um, not to mention the fact that of all of the... We talked a little bit about four as a conjunction, right? Because this is the second stanza that he started with a conjunction. Right? He started stanza four with a conjunction, and now he's starting stanza six with a conjunction. And um, so that's becoming a bit of a pattern here. Um, we started stanza two um, with a preposition, right? continuing that 
series of things like all all that's all that he has seen right um but exactly uh Velcondil, it's stronger because of the contrast too yeah but is an intrusive conjunction right you can go right over ands and not even notice that they're there and i talked about how four four is an unusual conjunction four has uh four does um not only a significant amount of work but um uh it's 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 uncommon. Um, you don't see it as a conjunction every day. Um, but though, um, but is always a big deal, right? I mean, but introduces a reversal of what you've said. It's always weighty in that way. It's always substantive. Um, you rarely get incidental buts, right? Um, and especially at the beginning of a stanza. When you start a stanza with, but, all the while I sit and think, it's hard to make it fit, um, it's hard to make it fit into the meter because it's supposed to be an unstressed syllable at the beginning. Even I sit, even the, the, even the I, right? One syllable, first person pronoun, still is, um, uh, it's easier. I sit, right? Um, and in fact, I kind of like the, the effect, right? It seems to me very uh, a- appropriate, even thematic, that the verb, the verb, the pronoun I is de- rhythmically de-emphasized all three times we hear it, right? In the same line, so of course it is. Um, uh It, it's fitting because, of course, as we've talked about, the I, the persona, the person doing the witnessing, the spectator is, is a minor character, right? Um, the speaker does go to the background here. And so it is fitting that I sit beside the fire and it should be about sitting, not about me, right? Not about I. Um, yeah, Blood the Inspirer says... Whenever I say it, um, but is just as stressed as all. Yeah, I have a hard time not doing that, too. Um, if I'm following the prompting of the meter that by stanza six has been drilled into my head, right, um, I want to say, but all the while I sit and think. Um, but it's hard to de-emphasize but. But all the while I sit and think. So I think that we do get a little bit of a stumble at the beginning of that first line there in the final stanza. But all the while I sit and think of times there were before. I listen for returning feet and voices at the door. I listen for returning feet. Notice again, we do get the de-emphasized I once again in stanza three. In fact, um, oh, that's cool. You know what I just noticed? What I just noticed is of all the eyes that we get in this poem, okay, interesting. When we get them in those first lines, the repeated lines, it's de emphasized. I sit beside the fire and think of all that I have seen. But did you hear what happened? I get stressed in the second line. And that happens everywhere. The I comes back and gets stressed when it comes in the second time. I sit beside the fire and think of how the world will be when winter comes without a spring that I shall ever see. That I shall ever see. It's stressed in that line. Similarly, that I have never seen. Similarly, that I shall never know, right? In all of those lines, the I is stressed. Um, It's in the introduction, in that framing line, I sit beside the fire and think that we get it de-stressed, right? Um, Until the last stanza. We get I sit and think again, de-stressed, in the first line. But all the while I sit and think, sit, 
think are the stresses there, right? The verbs. But then that third line, I listen for returning feet. He's, he's de-stressed again, right? He's uh, uh, de-emphasized the I in that third line. <laughs> That's interesting. I listen for... Okay. I'm just recognizing the other thing I was not quite stumbling over. But another mm, oddity? Yeah, Gil Dolowin, that's exactly what I was just noticing. Exactly. Um, for is a stressed syllable in that third line. And it's a little weird, right? It feels a little weird. I listen for returning feet. Um, it's weird. You normally wouldn't. He normally doesn't. We see prepositions get not stressed all over the place, right? Um, in every wood, in every spring, uh, for instance, right? Um, and uh, of times there were before, of all that I have seen, of meadow flowers, in summers, in autumns, with morning, um, uh, of how, um, I, I, you know, prepositions getting not stressed all over the place. Um, but four. Four is squarely in the middle. And you'll notice what sets that up. Do you see why? Do you see how he ended up with a stress on four? It's the word returning. It's the word returning. And you see why. The word returning should jump out to us. It's a three-syllable word. When was the last time we had a three-syllable word? When was the last time we had a three-syllable word? Uh, let's see. Different is two syllables. Nope. Only three-syllable word on this whole page. Now, different is two syllables. Different is two syllables. Um, gossamer. Yeah. Like, it's all the way back to gossamer. And then butterflies, which corresponds to gossamer. Yeah. How many three-syllable words in the poem? Three. <laughs> Total. Right? Um, stanza one and stanza two, linked directly to each other, and then returning feet at the end. I listen for returning feet. Returning, three-syllable word with a stress on the middle syllable. Right? We never... It's the only time we've gotten that pattern. Butterflies, gossamer. We get the stress on the first syllable in both of those three-syllable words. Right? And butterflies and gossamer. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it is, Bionasona, the only word with this metrical structure. And I, I point this out because, remember I said before, how do, you, how do you write a poem with a perfect iambic meter? Like this has almost, I mean, it's almost flawless, the iambic meter. Um, which is not, by the way, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not praising him by saying it's a perfect iambic meter. A poem with a perfect, unvaried meter is often a bad poem. Um, and it, in fact, it's really hard not to uh, perfect meter is often funny it's easier to do perfect meter in comedy hence dr seuss i mean it's one of the things that drives the comedy and light feel of so much of dr seuss's work is the perfection of his meter which is almost perfect and sometimes the more perfect it is um um the funnier the perfection of that meter makes the line. Um, uh, yes, Michael, I agree. Limericks are never funny if the meter is broken. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but, um, but anyway, so I, 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 I I don't want you to mistake my comments about the perfection of his I am's as being like some incredible poetic achievement. It's not, um, in a sense, it's not, um, I'm not saying it's easy to do. Um, 
what is a remarkable poetic achievement is um, none of us have been laughing in this poem. This is not a funny poem, right? Um, to have really perfect meter like this and yet attain um, to keep it from sounding sing-songy. That's what happens when your meter is too perfect. It sounds sing-songy. Um, you know, you start, you know, moving your head like this. Dun, 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 um, And it's, it becomes hard to take it seriously. Even hard to listen to the words, really, after a while. All you hear is the, like, kind of increasingly sort of jangling um, uh, rhythm. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, I, I'm not saying that's the inevitable reaction, but it's it's a serious risk. It's a serious danger when you have perfect rhythm. Um, most poets who use most metrical poets um, vary the meter on like it's designed to be imperfect. And that's true of Tolkien a lot of the time as well. Um, less so, much less so. And we've looked at some of the variations, but they're pretty subtle, like the the main rhythm goes on and on. Um, but there are some like people, for instance, is another example. People the 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 the, the people repetition there in stanzas five, um, it doesn't break the meter. Um any more than every and different break the meter. Um but it does disrupt the feel a little bit. Anyway, that was a digression. As I said before, how do you make perfect meter? What's the easiest way to make perfect meter? And the answer is monosyllables. Monosyllables, right? Short words. Short words. Returning a three-syllable word like that with the emphasis in the middle, that's hard. And this is why it's hard. Because when you do that, you end up, um, you end up putting a stress on a preposition like that. Um, a verb, a three-syllable verb that starts with an unstressed syllable, hard to fit into a perfect iambic line. Um, I listen for returning feet. But, so I completely agree um, with Gilgonthier that the the line almost doesn't fully trip, but it almost trips on that four. And like we have to do something different. It forces us to do something that we would not normally do, that indeed we've never done in this poem. It's the second to last line. And I don't think we've laid a stress on a single preposition the entire time. Sometimes there are two, uh, like a two syllable preposition, like beside the fire. That's got a stressed syllable in it, right? But that doesn't count. I'm talking about a monosyllabic preposition. Um, they've been unstressed every single time we've come across them uh, the entire way. Um, why? Why? Let me explain the why. <laughs> what do I mean by why? Why does he do this? Why does he do this? Um, is it because he couldn't think of another word? That's always the laziest possible answer. Besides which, the dude's maintained this all the way to this part of the poem. Do we think in the second to last line, he's just like, yeah, I just can't think of a two-syllable word. I'm out of two-syllable words. That's it. Gotta, gotta do a three-syllable word. Um, yeah. No. No. What is the preposition that is being stressed for? What's the interesting thing about the preposition in this line? The interesting thing about the preposition in this line is its connection with the verb, right? Um, yeah, Matt, you're just thinking the same thing. Um, listen for. For what? What was that? Did you hear it? Yes, yes. Um, listen is one of those verbs. There are bunches of them in English, right? One of those verbs that changes depending on what 
word comes after it, right? To listen to and to listen for are quite different things. And different from to listen. Right? I don't mean it describes a totally different, like, biological function or something. Um, but those are very different senses of the word listen, right? Um, uh, it becomes like, to li I listen for. For is, um, it's almost part of a verb phrase, right? So one of the things that I think, like, when I'm asking myself the why question, why stress that word? Like, why, 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 why does he let it happen? Why does Tolkien let that happen in that line? The stress fall in the preposition. Like it's, he is in way too careful control of his rhythm throughout this poem. He did not do that by accident. Um, uh, yeah, Gogo Eddy says he's anticipating the returning feet. Yeah, it emphasizes... It emphasizes the kind of um, the kind of listening, right? He's not just listening. He's not just listening. He's not just listening to something. He's listening for something. And listening for yes, uh, Matthew, it's active. Listen to is a active passive activity. To listen for something is active, right? Um, um, if you're listening for something, you are on edge, right? Um, you're on the edge of your seat. You are anticipating. Um, in fact, it really recontextualizes the whole sitting beside the fire and thinking situation, right? Sitting beside the fire and thinking has been a leisurely activity so far, right? But if you're sitting beside the fire and thinking involves listening for something, you are alert, right? You are, I want to say on guard, but not necessarily in like a defensive way or as, as if it's necessarily something bad, but, but you know what I mean? Like you're, you're, you're engaged. You're, 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 it's, it's very active in that way. Um, so yes, I think that it does exactly as you're saying, Bjorning, put the four, uh, um, put it, it emphasizes the active nature um, of the conclusion here. That's what I keep coming back to. When I'm asking my quest, the why question, why, 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 why stress that? Why, why let that happen? Like, you know, um, a spotlight, it's, it's the, the rhythm is shining a spotlight on the word for. It's awkward. It's weird. It's a little strange. Um, and it's, I would add, the second time in three lines that we've had possibly the closest to a variation from the, again, you can still do it. You can still make it perfect because, you know, your ear gets used to the rhythm. Your ear gets used to the rhythm, and by the time you get to this point, you're likely to force it into the perfect iambic shape just because your ear is telling you to do that, right? I mean, you've got the, you've got the metronome in, going in your head by this point. Um, but if we let ourselves, the perfect meter does start to break down in this stanza, in the first two syllables. But all the while I sit and think, and by the way, I saw, I forgot who said it, but I saw the comment earlier on that Tom Bombadil would not be surprised by the beginning of that first line. And of course, you are quite correct. Tom Bombadil, Mr. I never saw a line that I didn't start with a spondy. Yeah, yeah. Um, spondy, uh, you may remember, uh, spondy means two or more stressed syllables in a row. Um, it's, 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 it's a way of varying from a metrical foot, technically, you could write in spondy. Um, only if you were, like, shouting at somebody. <laughs> it's almost impossible to maintain um, where every syllable is stressed. Um, uh, language really kind of requires unstressed syllables. Um, but um, anyway, Tom Bombadil, of course, you remember Tom Bombadil's lines always begin with spondy, right? You, almost always three in a row. Ho, Tom Bombadil, Tom Bombadillo. Um, so you're right. Tom Bombadil would not be surprised to find a spondaic foot there at the beginning of the line. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, we get that little spondaic variation at the beginning of the first line there. But all the while I sit and think of times there were before I listen for returning feet and voices at the door. Um, 
I listen for returning feet and voices at the door. You can convince yourself those last two lines don't break the meter. And they don't, but they do... If you don't break the meter, they do weird things with the words, right? And the weird thing, as we talked about, was shining that that light on it. Um, and I agree, it doesn't offset the rhythm established. It doesn't... It, it, it wouldn't make you trip. If you were dancing, you wouldn't miss a step. Um, it's not that kind of an interruption. Um, like when you add an extra syllable, for instance. Adding an extra syllable really messes with things. That's very audible. You'll remember, that's why I was... Uh, perseverating about that extra syllable in the ring meter, in the ring, you know, in the uh, in the black speech, uh, ring poem for ever, uh, because it bothers me, <laughs> right? Um, but um, um, but I agree, Wobe, that it's not um, um, it's not that kind of a deviation. It doesn't it doesn't shatter it or something. Um, yeah. Okay, more. More on the sounds. And I saw, um, uh, Dan, I saw you had made a comment before about one of the other interesting things about landing on the word for with an unusual weight, an unexpected weight in line three, is that it also creates an internal rhyme between for and door and before, right? Um, yes, yes. Um, that seems to me vastly uncoincidental, right? We have another strong rhyme between lines two and four, as we've seen in almost every case, not quite every case, of course. Um, most famous, whoa, hang, hang on, where's my poem? Um, uh, most famously, um, not in uh, uh, stanza two, right? With the, with the were and hair rhyme. Um, but, um, we've not gotten this rhyme before, an O-R rhyme before, but it kind of flows from the previous one. A go and no were different. We've had seen, been, were, hair, b, c, seen, green, a go, no. And we talked about how that introduced a change, but to go from a go, no, to before door is much less of a big jump, right? Um, much less of a big jump. Um, so we're kind of set up for it, right? But to come back to Dan's point, which I think is, um, uh, which I think is really um, an interesting point, he inserts a third rhyme, right? I don't think we've ever gotten that. Have we ever gotten that? We got gossamer in autumns that there were, but as we didn't have a good rhyme in line four, what we had was kind of a displacement, right? Um, I don't think we've gotten three rhymes like that. Unless I'm missing it. I don't think so. I don't think so. Um... But all the while I sit and think of times there were before I listen for returning feet and voices at the door. The four, that stressed, weirdly stressed syllable, right? Unexpectedly stressed syllable in line three becomes the, a, a sort of bridge, right? Between before and door, giving us the or rhyme not at the end of three lines in a row. Um... But it creates something more like, a, uh, like a sort of triplet kind of deal there. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Two juice man, I see. Uh, we've got to go back and look closely at Ashnaz Durbatiluk. Um, yeah, actually, fun story. Uh, I'm uh, going to be talking soon with. Um, uh, one of our Signum MA students who's thinking of doing his MA thesis on uh, uh, on, on that. So uh, stay tuned. There could be more about the ring verse. Who knows? Um, but um, anyway. Um, okay. So we, that the, the way that the four bridges before and door, um, that internal rhyme seems very important. Um 
ending the line with feet. That it, getting the double E sound at the end of that line it doesn't pick up on anything in that stanza. Um, but notice we got think again. Unsurprisingly, right? Fourth time we've had think at the end of a at the end of a line. Um, but the the double E sound in feet connects us back to the that dominant sound, right? C B seen bean seen green that we had in the rhyme scheme in the first, you know, two thirds of the poem. Um, we don't get a return to that rhyme scheme. We don't get C again. We're still not seeing. Um, we haven't been seeing now for two stanzas. Other people were seeing in stanza five, other people seeing that world that I shall never know. Um, but our speaker has not been seeing in two stanzas. But we do get we do get a little echo in the feet, the returning feet. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Okay. What else? What else about um, either the, 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 the sounds, the consonants or vowels? Other alliterative patterns that we're seeing? Here's an interesting thing. Um, the first thing I was doing was looking at the S because this is a pattern that we've traced several times. Um, I sit beside at the beginning of three of our, you know, six stanzas um, has introduced that S repetition at the very beginning. And we were looking at how that gets picked up in other places. Um, where does the S sound? We get he's still sitting and thinking he's not sitting beside anything. So we don't get that double S. I sit beside uh, two stressed syllables in a row. Um, where do we... Uh, but we do get another S. Um, yeah. Voices is where I really hear it, primarily. Um, times. I don't think I count times, because that's the voiced version. It's the, at the First, it's at the end of a word. Um, and having it in the middle of a word is okay, but like alliteration, you're primarily hearing it at the beginning of a at the beginning of a syllable, right? Now we talked about, he's done a kind of a medial sound thing, right? With every wood, every spring, different green, never every, every different. He's kind of alliterating on that middle sound, right? The, the F and V sound. Um, so we've seen him do some middle of word things uh, before there. Um, yeah, Jenny, I agree. Listen um, is important. Um, I sit, I listen, um, uh, I listen for, um, yeah, and voices. Um, it's that voice. Yeah, this, it, the soft C is the one that really stands out to me for Thoughtless. That's the what I would say is the prime. Voices, um, the S at the end of voices is, is like at the end of times is another voiced S. Um, but, but I think it, it's closer because of its proximity to the soft C voices, you are a little bit more, it, it sounds more like a double sibilant because of that first sibilant, I think. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So the sitting and thinking, um, I sit beside the fire and think of all that I have seen, right? The sit beside was connecting to the seeing both Logically, like in the actual syntax of the sentence, like that's what he's doing. That's why he, you know, he's what he's doing while he's sitting beside the fire and thinking um, is he's thinking about what he has seen. Um, so we got that was the sort of significance of the S's before, um, even when it was sort of dramatically delayed right in stanza three, when we finally got back around to that I shall ever see. Right. Um, but here those S's come back with the sitting and thinking. The S's come back, but they come back not to seeing, but to listening. Listening and voices. Right. Um, that's what he's listening for, in fact. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, also the F's. Yes, I agree. I think, uh, Drasnik, you were talking about that. Um, before, for, feet. Yes. 
Um, I agree. Those are, that's an important constellation of sounds there. Of times there were before, I listen for returning feet. Huh. That's really interesting, isn't it? The juxtaposition, the four juxtaposition. We get two fours, not quite in a row, but two fours quite close to each other, right? Before, and I listen for that, you know, our stressed four there. Um, and that's kind of fun because... Um, uh, that's kind of fun because before is about the past, right? Times there were before. So before is about the past, but listen for is a future thing, right? I mean, it's, about, it's something you're doing in the present, but anticipating a future event. That's why you're listening for it, right? Um, so we get a shift there between the past and the future, which really gets emphasized by the juxtaposition of those two fours, picked up, therefore, by the internal rhyme, but also by the alliteration. Um, before, for, feet. It's the feet that he's listening to. And yes, um, uh, uh, as, uh, yes, as uh, Vel Cannondil, sorry, I think I lost a syllable from your screen name there before. As Vel Cannondil says, um, the voices also does that semi-alliteration, right? The fricative uh, with four, four feet voices. Um, like we got never, every, every different, right? We got V, 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 F in uh, stanza four, and here we're getting F, 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 V. Wow, golly. That's exactly the opposite, isn't it? He can't be deliberately inverting that. Would he do that? He would totally do that. Did he do that? Huh. I wonder. We'll have to remember to come back to that connection. Um, yeah, we'll have to come back to that connection. That is the connection between the last three lines of stanza four and the last three lines of stanza six there. Um, yeah, so sorry uh, to explain that more. Sure. Um, so we get the the that fricative V sound, which is not at the beginning of that's the one I mentioned just a, a minute ago. It's not at the beginning of a syllable. Um, it stands a four there at the top of the page that I have never seen in every wood in every spring. There is a different green. So we get the never every every different um, and the F and the V. It's a, it's the same sound, except you voice. One, you're using your voice box, and the other, you're just using the air, right? F, f, v. Um, uh, so V and F are almost the same uh, sound, um, almost the same consonant. It's like P and B, same thing, P and B, um, the one voiced and the, and the other unvoiced. Anyway, um, uh, okay, anyhow, so um, we got the V, V, V. F, which is like the V, so it's not quite the same, right? But I was kind of connecting them together, the four fricatives that we got there. And um, and then in the sixth stanza there, we get the F, 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 before four feet voices with the V at the end. Um, yeah, so it's the same pattern, but it's inverted. It's exactly the same, except inverted. Um, and that's what I'm trying to figure out if I think he did that on purpose. Um, can't rule it out, as you say. Um, okay, that's pretty cool. Um, and um, uh, inverted fricatives. Uh, inverted fricatives would be a good band name, except people would think it was like uh, rude in some way, even though it's not. At least the word fricative always sounds like, I'm always tempted to use that word as an expletive, right? Ah, fricative, you know, like, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, you know, get off the fricative chair, you know, like it's, um, it sounds like it should be an expletive, but um, it uh, isn't. Um, but I guess if you want to use an expletive at a time and place when you shouldn't, um, you could get away with that. Um, uh, but, um, anyway, uh, 
Okay, looking back, there was another observation. Somebody said... Um, okay. Um, uh, okay. Were there other alliterative things? Oh, there was some talk about there were before, um, which is interesting. Um, Nancy's wondering if fire can have two syllables or are you having a southern U.S. moment? I think you're having a southern U.S. moment. I think that fire is usually not a two-syllable word in most of the rest of the English-speaking world, though I can easily imagine it being a two-syllable word um, uh, in the South. Um, <laughs> I, will, I will never forget... Um, when I was a long time ago, when my cousin from North Carolina, he was like three uh, at the time. And I'm sitting there in a room that contained his mom and my mom. And my three, at the time, three year old cousin Nathan comes running in crying. And his mom says, What happened? And he said, I fail. And it was just like, each syllable was perfectly equal, and I just I laughed so hard. I'm like, that is the coolest thing I've ever heard. Like, ah, fey, yo, and like like the Y was practically like you could have alliterated on that Y in the middle of the word fell. Um, but um, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I can totally believe that in the South, fire might be two syllables, um, but I don't think so. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, It is, yeah, Alia Arrow, yeah. I mean, you can put like a Y ish in the middle of it. Fi year, right? Fi year. Um, it is at least a slightly peculiar monosyllable, um, fire. Uh, the R, I blame the R. Um, I know, see, I, I disagree with you. I'm not doing it two syllables. Um, and here's why an R. An R makes you, um, uh, an R makes you, like, turn a corner, right? Um, it's the same thing I was hearing in every wood, every spring, every is still a two-syllable word. But that R, man, like, it takes a while to get around that R. Like, R's, R's are time-consuming, right? Um, I mean, it's, um, I mean, yeah, the liquid consonants, they're weird, um, and, um, uh, yeah, um, and so having an R in the middle of a one syllable word like that, like F I R E, certainly, um, it sounds different than, you know, something like, uh, fight or, uh, fig or something like that, right? Fire, but fire, fire, it's one syllable, fire. And I agree, fear, fire, foes, awake is emphatically a one-syllable fire, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, now if you trill the R, Dan, or flip the R, flipping the R is even better. One of the things that you get, one of the benefits of flipping your R's is that it's faster. You get around them faster, right? If you really round the R into an R sound, f I, I mean... That's where you get your two-syllable fire, fire. If you really are, if you really get it, you can put that Y sound in front. Um, but if you, uh, how do you flip an R uh, with your tongue? Um, uh, so you roll an R, right, by drawing it out. Um, uh, uh, green. There's a good example. So you can roll your R and say green, right? Um, and then you really play the R, right? But you can just flip it and say green, green. It's almost like the D. You you do almost like a quick D uh, uh, in your in, in your. Like it, it's the tongue at the top of the, uh, the 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 top of your mouth very very quickly. Um, it's like rolling it, except you don't let it happen multiple times, just once. So, you know, 
the green, right? The sound that you get when you're rolling the R. Um, that sound, which is made by the, the your, your tongue, you know, smacking up against the roof of your mouth lots and lots of times, right? Um, uh, just do it once, and that's a flip dar, right? Um, uh, so, um, yes, when you roll your arms, if you roll your R's a lot, Almarea, you start to sound like a Wookiee. That, that's, that's, that's precisely right. Um, except they do it, like, in the back of their throats. It's really, I have a hard time with that, actually. Um, but, um, okay, anyway, anyway, anyway. Um, but, so, yes, if you flip your R's, they're faster. Um, you don't have to, you don't have to get around them uh, so much. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway. Okay. Speaking of R's that take a long time to get around though, let's go back to our, our, our favorite sound line here. Line three of stanza, uh, uh, stanza six. You see what happens with the R's there? See what happens with the R's? I listen for returning feet. The double R, like R at the end of the word for, and then the R at the beginning of the word returning. It's almost impossible not to blend those two words together when you do that. Right. Um, but um, that's a, a, a very strong R there uh, as a consequence, um, linking those two words together. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I, Spanish does both tapped R's and trilled R's. Yeah, you could say, you can say tapped. I say flipped. I don't know where I was taught that, but yeah, it's a, that's, that's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, Yeah. I don't know who's doing the Mythmoot paper on Wookiee phonetics. I hope that somebody does. And maybe can explain, like, Wookiees have lips, man. Why don't they use them? Right? Like, lips are useful when it comes to language. Just like, you know, I don't, like, I don't know what was going on at Kashi, on Kashi Eek, but, like, seriously, man, like, get some labials or something. Um, but, um, anyway, yeah. Um, uh, uh, um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Other patterns? Okay. Larger shape of the stanza. Once again, as has now been true three out of four times. Uh, three out of... Three out of four times. Three out of four times in six stanzas. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I meant four out of six times. Um, we have a comma in the middle of the stanza, right? Comma between line two and three in the stanza. We had another break... Right, it's stanza three that really sticks out. That um, has an elision, right? That elides, uh, you know, goes straight in, in jams. Not an elision, an enjambment, technically. That enjams straight from line two to line three. That's the so uh, when it comes to the rhythm of the lines, um, line or stanza three was the kind of freakish one, um, and uh, we have the comma here again. Um, however. The comma is doing something weird, um, different. Syntactically, this stanza is like crazy, right? I, I mean, like this. This is a deviant stanza, right? Um, what do I mean by that? Well, look at the syntactical shape of the stanza so far. I sit beside the fire and think of. Now remember, we got the of stuff going on, right? Of all, of meadow, of yellow, right? We're continuing down into the second stanza in autumns with morning mist, right? These are all the, all that I have seen, 
right? All the prepositional phrases I have, I have seen, right, is what we get in stanzas one and two. That's what he's sitting beside the fire and thinking about. Stanza three, I sit beside the fire and think, and we talked about the shift to the subordination. It's no longer a list. It's the subordination, right, of this, when that happens, under these circumstances, right, uh, then. And then in stanza four, for still there are so many things that I have never seen, and we get the colon, which makes us expect another list, like we got in stanza one into stanza two, right? And then instead of a list, we get that statement, Right, that like faith claim, right? In every wood, in every spring, there is a different green. Um, in stanza five, as we were discussing last week, we return to something much more like the syntactical shape of stanza one. I sit beside the fire and think of people long ago. We got another of thing, right? But instead of getting a series of of things, we just get two, right? Of people long ago and people who will see a world that I shall never know. So instead of introducing instead of signaling that we're at the beginning of a series of things that he's thinking about, um, instead we have, he's splitting up the two groups, like people and people. That's what I'm sitting and thinking. I'm thinking about people and people, right? With a comma in between them to break up the two groups of people. People long ago, group A and group B of people, right? That's, that's what I'm thinking about. Um, so... We can see variations in how he's approaching these things, um, but variations doesn't enter into it when we um, get into the last stanza, right? But all the while, I sit and think of times there were before, comma, I listen for returning feet and voices at the door. What on earth just happened there? I see what happened there. And I'm shocked and appalled, though part of my appalledness is about me being an American. Um, we start with a big butt, yes. We start with a big butt. Um, let me ask a trick question. What's the subject and verb of this sentence? Trick question. What's the subject and verb of this sentence? Do you see why it's a trick question? Fourth Dauntless, exactly. There are two. There are two. There are two, and this is a run-on sentence. There are two independent clauses. Right? Now, the fact that it's a run-on sentence is why I said that I was appalled. Um, when I said um, uh, part of being appalled is being an American here, I mean, comma this is a comma splice. We would say this is a comma splice. Two independent clauses joined only by a comma. Oh, man, your English teacher will come down on you like a ton of bricks for that, right? Um, the comma splice was much more normal, clearly in... Um, English usage at this time, at least. I mean, I'm pretty sure that nowadays over in the UK, there's fairly, fairly anti comma splice. Um, but you can see comma splices like this, two independent clauses joined together with a comma multiple times in Tolkien. Um, and, uh, you, and, and I, you, you can find it in C.S. Lewis. Um, no, it's not, I, um, It's possible, Dolor is struck. That's interesting. You could use that as a subordination. Anyway, just to finish my thought, you can find other comma splices in Tolkien and in C.S. Lewis as well. Again, I think it was, it wasn't common. Um, from all I can tell, from like empirical evidence, it would seem to me the conclusion I would draw is that. Um, dividing two independent clauses with only a comma is kind of like starting a sentence with a conjunction in England at that time. Not something you do all the time, and if you do it all the time, it's going to be a fault. It's not going to work really well, but you can do it occasionally, and no one's going to, like, 
come gunning for you. Um, but uh, but anyway, Dollar Stroke's idea, which Gil Dolowin agrees with, is um, all the while, if we if we all if we think of the phrase "all the while," not as a prepositional phrase, like not as a, an adverbial phrase, but as a subordinating phrase, a- operating like the word while would operate, right? Because um, if you said like, while I sit and think of times there were before, I listen for returning feet, that's not two independent causes. That's one subordinate cause and then a, an independent cause, right? The word while all by itself would make it into a subordinate cause. So if we do take up Dolores Stroke's suggestion and read all the while um, as a subordinating concept rather than merely an adverbial phrase, I sit and think, when do you think? All the while. Or under what conditions? All the while. Right. Um, if instead of that, if we think of it as a subordination, all the while I sit and think of times there were before, I listen for returning feet. It makes I listen for simply the independent clause. Um, I like it. I like it. Um, for Thoughtless says, but if we did this, wouldn't the first clause be subordinated to the previous stanza? Um, well, not exactly, because, again, syntactically, it's subordinated to the independent clause within that same sentence, which is, I listen for returning feet and voices at the door. Um, well, I listen. I listen. Right. I listen for. I listen for what? Feet and voices. Um, uh, where are the voices? At the door. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's subordinating, I listen. But for Thomas, I, I think I see what you mean, right? And if I'm right in seeing what you mean, I would go even further, right? I would go even further. Um, he's not subordinating it to what the sentence before. What he's doing is subordinating the entire first five stanzas of the poem. Right? What has this poem been about? Stanza one through stanza five. What's this poem about? Sitting and thinking. Right? I sit beside the fire and think. Of this, of that, of that other thing, right? Of summers and autumns, I sit and think of how the world will be. I sit and think of people long ago and people who will see a world. Right? Um... That's what this poem is about, sitting by the, by the fire and thinking. And then that entire concept of sitting and thinking, which this poem has all been about, gets subordinated. This is why I like the subordinating reading. Te- technically, grammatically, syntactically, it doesn't. Um, but I like it for this reason. Um, it subordinates all of that sitting and thinking. I listen for returning feet and voices at the door. That's, it's like that's the main action. It turns out that all of this sitting and thinking is just to pass the time until the returning feet and the voices come to the door. At the end of the day, this song isn't about, ultimately, not about reflection. It's not about thinking of old times. It's not thinking about his relationship to the world. It's not thinking about his own, his coming death. It's thinking about waiting for people to return. It's not even about thinking about. It's about listening for. Listening for voices. Listen for feet, voices. Right? Um, that's what this poem's about. It's all about the returning feet at the end of the day. Right? The rest of it is, is subordinate. The rest of it is a pastime. Um, and we get this expressed, or we get introduced to this with the but. Right? But that strong 
nearly or practically or functionally spondaic but at the beginning of the first line um, introduces a shift, right? If you're going to start a stanza with but, you're introducing a change, right? Something that's going to reverse what came before. And reversing what came before is exactly what we see, right? But all the while I sit and think of times there were before, I listen for returning feet and voices at the door. And darn it if he doesn't reverse the fricatives. <laughs> Beginning to think it's deliberate. Beginning to think it's deliberate. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I hear you, Gildalwin. I, I, yes. Um, Gildalwin is exactly correct. Um, but is a coordinating conjunction that expresses contrast with what came before. Whereas, while here is a subordinating conjunction to what comes after. Yep, agreed. But all the while does not move like that forward phrase taken as a forward phrase does not push in the same direction. Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, that's why I wasn't even hearing it in a subordinating way. Um, Dolores struck now that you point that out. I agree. Um, I think it's very interesting. I love what it does to the poem, um, to that stanza, to subordinate that first clause. Um, but Gil Dolowin's observation is precisely why I didn't, um, precisely why I didn't even think of that, right? Because um, that's not where the but pushes me. Um, uh, you know what? You start with you st independent clauses. You start with but, right? Not subordinate clauses. Subordinate clauses rarely start with but. Um, uh, yeah. Um, Yeah, Fourth Thoughtless says, I I'm really glad we did this long, close reading. I always just read that comma as a semicolon. Yeah, it's not a semicolon. Um, I'm grappling with that, too. Again, I, 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 the comma splice is what I had heard. And again, I'm I'm OK with that. Like, I'm down with the occasional comma splice. You know, I'm not going to tell I'm not going to tell Tolkien what is and is not in his culture. Like, it's it's cool. <laughs> like, it's local customs. Um, um but um, so Gilgalm there, I don't want to lose it though. I, I, I get that again. You're right. But and while do different things, they do different things, and um, uh, yeah. Oh, Rachel, what a wonderful observation. Rachel on YouTube says um, the whole stanza is a turn. Right. And the stanza itself, we've got that word returning, which has the emphasis in the middle. Right. The that the word returning. Right. Which pivots with the stress syllable in the middle of the three uh, syllable word, as we were talking about before. Um, yes. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, again, at the end of the day, it's all about the returning. Right. Um, we're pivoting around in this last stanza um, because, of course, we're waiting. It's not just arriving feet, right? Um, this isn't just a song about a lonely old dude who's hoping somebody comes by to visit today, right? It's not visiting feet. It's not arriving feet. It's returning feet, right? People who are coming back that whose feet he is listening for and whose voices he is listening for. Um, hmm. Matt's wondering, why are we reading but and while independently instead of as a single phrase, but all the while? 
And my answer to that, Matt, is simply exactly along the lines Gil Gomthier says, is that but and while normally do different things. I mean, logically, they're doing different things. It's not just a, um, grammar rules and, and stuff. Like, it's not, you know, it's just not the laws of nature here, you know. Um, but they do describe an actual thing. You know, they do describe... Um, there is logic there, right? And the logic of those two words does point in different directions. Um, but indicates a logical relationship between what comes after and what came before. It joins what came after and what came before. It, 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 it attaches, logically attaches, stands a six onto the rest of the poem, right? With a twist, right? With a, with, with a reversal. That's how but differs from and, right? Um, however, um, uh, while does work, does logical work, but the logical work that it does is place the clause that comes after it in a subordinated logical position to the final, to the one that comes after that, right? Um, very different, very different, um, uh, very different logical moves. We could, um, yes, it is. How is, how is it different from and all the while? Um, okay. In one sense, it's not right. And and but are both conjunctions, both and, and but, um, either and or but as the first word of this stanza, would serve to link it in some way to the previous stanza, to the poem that came before, right? Um, but, of course, just introduces the the pivot, the shift, the reversal. Um, and so in that sense, Almerea, um, but and and are both doing something quite different than while. Um, um, but Matt, I'm now going back and I'm trying to make it one single logical function in my head, but all the while. In order to do it, Matt, what I find I have to do <laughs> This doesn't make any sense. But I almost turn but into a metaphor. That's not exactly right. That is not ascribing a logical function to but. It's not literally a conjunction. It's not conjoining anything. It's a spiritual butt. <laughs> We've already talked about spiritual butts. We're coming back to spiritual butts again, but of a different sort. Um, Almaria, you already said it. Yeah, it's a spiritual butt. It's a spiritual butt. It's not a literal conjunction, right? If it were not to be, right, just introduce it in contrast, Michael. That's exactly it. Like, starting with the word butt just to get you in a reversal frame of mind, right? Start thinking, um, start thinking in a, in a, in a, in a, in a butt-esque direction. Right. Um, but then the logical work is going to be done by while or the in this case, the phrase all the while. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I. Um, I can just make myself get behind that. But like the idea of a conjunction that doesn't conjoin like uh, that. You know, the spiritual conjunction, I, I, I don't know. I don't think I can really convince myself of it. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, 
<laughs> Michael, you'd like to introduce a butt-esque direction. <laughs> it's a phrase you'd like to try on the sixth graders. Yeah, we'll see how that goes over uh, with the sixth graders. I bet they'll, I, I bet they'll enjoy it. Let me just say that. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. Hmm. Um, it's possible. It's possible. The logic of a subordination with the oomph, right, of a, of a reversal of a butt. Um, Okay, so Matt gives us a sample sentence. But all the while he was doing his work, he was thinking of home. I'm not saying it doesn't work. But I feel that in the... in both that sentence and in this stanza, I'm feeling the same thing, the same tension between but and while. But if you're going to say, but all the while he was doing his work, he was thinking of home, you're connecting with something like, I can tell there's a sentence I'm missing, right? Like, what's the but butting, right? Like, there's, it's, that's linking me back to what came before. Um... But I guess here's the thing. At the end of the day, although the syntactical logic of those two words is different, they are pointed in the same direction. The but connects this stanza to what happened before and reverses it. And the while what is literally subordinating the repeated phrase that came before. I sit and think. Right? Um, all the while I sit and think of times there were before. I listen for returning feet. So, um, both of them are kind of going in the same direction. Yeah, the butt signals the reversal. And the it's not just that the subordination does the same thing. It doesn't do the same thing as the conjunction. But in this sentence, it has the same... It has, it, it's, it's, it's going in the same direction, right? Not because it is subordinating, but because of what it is subordinating. It is subordinating, I sit and think, of times that were before. In other words, it is subordinating the whole action of the entire first five stanzas to the last two lines. Um... Yeah, yeah. So, at the end of the day, um, I'm cool with it. It works. Um, I'm not complaining. Um, if anything, I guess, dragging it out. And not, not only are we dragging it out by having the but while together, but the all the is unnecessary. Right? But while I sit and think, I listen for returning feet it has the same logical effect, right? Um, so it it takes that idea, that reversal reversal of direction, which also subordinates the entire thrust of the poem to the new idea, right? Um, uh, it um, he lingers on that for four entire syllables, right? Um, yeah, man, it would be interesting to see ways in which but all the while is used. Um, can somebody do a quick search? It doesn't happen again in The Lord of the Rings, does it? But all the while? Somebody search for that phrase, see if it's there. I don't... I don't think it is. But, um... Uh, but I'd be interested to see. Um... Uh, Yeah, yeah. Now, oh, I agree, 
uh, for Thoughtless. I'm not saying the Alva is useless. I'm saying it's logically unnecessary. It does add. It definitely does add. Not and not only two syllables. Um, okay, all the while and all the and and all the while are there. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, Matt's trying to remember if it was an echo of, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that in Hibernian English. I never trust, I, I never guess how to pronounce Hibernian English. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, if there is one language that I am unwilling to take a stab at pronouncing uh, 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 by sight reading it, it's anything Irish. Um, yeah, yeah. Three more all the whiles in The Return of the King. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yep. All the while does not surprise me. You get, we get, but all the while in the Hobbit. No, that doesn't surprise me. Why does it hang on? Uh, well, let me see if I can come up with it. But all the while, oh, I've almost got it. It's right there. Oh, when does he use it in the Hobbit? I love this game. Uh, it's one of my favorite games. Um, but all the while, now it's going to take me too long to think of it, and it's getting super late. Spoil it, JJ. When is it? Um, he wandered on out of the little high valley over its edge and down the slopes beyond, but all the while a very uncomfortable thought was growing inside him. Okay. Very good. Very good. Um, and there, interestingly, it happens after a semicolon. Huh. Fascinating. Fascinating. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's on the doorstep. Exactly. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. No, not the doorstep. Right. That, that, the back door of the goblin tunnels. The uncomfortable thought growing in him is that he has to go back and find the dwarves. That he should now that he has a magic ring. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes. All right. Um, Let's stop there. Next time, we'll do some big picture discussion of the poem. Now that we've looked at it in very great detail, um, we'll go back over the poem. We'll think about the big picture. Um, as you say, uh, Bjorning, what this, um, what this poem, uh, the, the meaning of the poem, and then especially thinking about the context, right? Thinking about, um, uh, thinking about, Bilbo and Frodo's conversation that was just leading up to this, and then maybe even, who knows, looking at what comes after, we'll see. Perhaps next week we shall even move on from this poem. Um, uh, <laughs> Drosnik says, everyone who had greater than or equal to seven weeks collect your winnings. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, excellent question. Bricktails, wonderful question that we will try to come back to uh, last time. Um, uh, when did Bilbo compose this poem? Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. It's a great question. It's a great question. Is this a spontaneous poem? Um, yeah. Great question. Let's talk about that next time. All right. I will let folks go. Field trip time. Uh, soon we're going to be done with poetic exposition where I feel compelled to try to finish a stanza per class, um, which I've been increasingly failing at over the last couple of weeks. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll round up this poem next time. And uh, I will... Uh, uh, so good night to folks who can't stick around. And we will have field trip time. All right. Um, How are you doing yeah. this week? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. All right. So are we um, are we uh, milestoning? Yeah, we collected the milestone, right? Yeah, to Mirabel. Yeah, to Mirabel. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. 
Oh, Nancy, I like that theory. Remember to bring up that theory next week, Nancy. We'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Okay. Echad Mirabel. So we are down in the southwestern corner of uh, Eregion, um, near where the rings of power were forged. Yeah. Okay. So let's start with where we are here. Now, just because the milestone is here doesn't necessarily mean that this hall... I'm going with hall. Domed ceiling. Wow, what a very complete domed ceiling. Almost no gaps. No gaps at all. Yeah. Wow, there's usually some parts of it broken off. Yeah, I think this might be the closest we get to seeing an intact one. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, like, the more, one of the things that we had, um, uh, that we kind of speculated about when we were looking at the these um, you know filigreed dome ceilings in other places was whether or not there might have been glazing back in the day, right? Did they yeah. have glass on this, or was it or was it open? But you know, seeing it completed like this, I don't think there was glass. Yeah, it's easier to imagine glass when there are the bigger gaps here when I'm seeing it like this I don't know that there would be I mean would, yeah, it, yeah. So, well yeah and Emily makes a good point here glass would be a clean if it was up there it'd be easier to, to have like yeah. a cloth awning you stretch across on hot or wet days right yeah no, it would for sure um, what is this motif here with the leaves and grapes is it the well, around, in, on the walls yeah. yeah, grapes. Clearly grapes. Clearly grapes. We have this vine thing, which is not unknown, right? We see lots of elvish architecture that has vine, um, you know, vine motifs there. But um, the grapes, have we seen this before? I have a feeling that we've seen grapes like this before, but not, not frequently. Not intact either. Yeah. I mean, this whole place is incredibly well preserved mm -hmm. which by the way seems to me to suggest not prove but kind of suggest that we're right to think that these arches are just supposed to be open arches that you can look through yeah. um, not you know because I mean when you see just an arch standing there all on its own um, you know, in a fragment of broken wall, you know, you think like, maybe there were doors, you know, maybe there were gates there of some kind, right? But I think there wasn't. If there were, there would be some evidence. I mean, everything else is so complete. Um, yeah. Almost nothing is broken off in here. And so, yeah, we have, we have yeah a there would be some evidence. The great motif is new to this it area. Is new? We've seen okay, yeah, I, similar, but I, I didn't not remember. Identical. Certainly, it's just way more prominent. I mean, it's grapes ever because the the color, right? The that 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 bluish color of the grapes is yeah. a color we haven't seen. I mean, it's in contrast to the that sort of teal color that we're still getting on the inside of the door frames there, right? Yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah. I'm guessing, what with the grapes and all, that this is probably like a a, a, a hall of feasting of some kind, right? Um, or was, you know, back in the day. Um, yeah. Tomas is wondering whether or not it might be safe to think or suspect, at least, Um that there was some restoration work here. I mean, we know that there are elves who are living here. Like, was this hall restored? Um, the gold is pretty shiny. It is. It is. Um, you could imagine the, you know, kind of trellis work, the filigree work up there in the ceiling being partially reconstituted in places. 
it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, my if it is argument... gold, it would have been fairly damaged over the years. It would have been mm -hmm. they would have had to replace. It. It would have been soft to withstand. My Central. argument against it would be against it being a restoration. That is, would simply be the lack of restoration anywhere else, right? I mean, why here? Why here? We've not seen them restore anything, um, even in other places where they were currently living. Um, why would they necessarily do it? Do it here? Um, yeah. I mean, this place isn't very protected by the element. No. No. If anything, this place would have got the worst of it. It's right up against the mountains. Yeah, we're way high up, right? I mean, you got to think the, the winds that this place would be exposed to on a regular basis Dead would be it. fairly intense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I don't know. And there's a little it's, sort of sheltering shoulder over here that's going to shelter it from stuff. I guess on the other side, too. And so we are up on top, but there are some sheltering things around a little bit. I mean, no. Kind of a brim bar. Maybe there was some sort of magic in... Right. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, as Amorea is saying, well, this is the place where the, you know, preserve things, unstained rings were made. So, you know, maybe... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Kel Brimbor is into that kind of thing. Wouldn't be shocking to believe that. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Wibbly wobbly magic you magic. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah. Getting the full moon through the, through the, through the windows there to the, the roof there. That's, oh, that is pretty. I do like cool. that. Yeah. So, nice. Looks like we got this like little guard tower ramp up here on the side. Yeah, I was just looking because I was noticing when we were looking. I was looking up at the. Oh, they won't let us go further than this. <laughs> so we can't get all the way up to this. Presumably, this goes all the way around and then up to the topmost one up there. Yeah, right? that's that's the one we saw from across the river. I think. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Probably a watchtower or a sun. But look at these roofs. These roofs are different. These little Romanesque arches here. Yeah, we've got the Romanesque arches, and then we've got the the brown work there um, on the top of the... It's like the um, faux wood grain, metallic faux wood grain that we were seeing first in Gwingaris, and like Jeju said, we haven't found any more of those metal-plated stone looking trees that randomly fell off. Um uh leaf that's falling or it's break. Yeah. Hang on, Amethorn, are you saying there are are, are there a grapes a grape motif there in Elrond's library in Rivendell? Is that what you're saying? Well the, I think they were pointing at the glass ceiling. Oh that's a glass Oh the glazing ceiling. of the ceiling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh well that's a library. Oh, the glass ceiling. Uh, Amethorn, got it. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Books, not so great for... It's a library, right? We're not going to keep our books out. You know, elves might be all into the elements. And as I've said before, I, I, I can easily imagine that I can more... As I've said before, I can more easily imagine the Noldor designing fabric that either resisted or, like, absorbed or wicked away or whatever, like, interacted interestingly and comfortably with rain. Um, I can more easily imagine that than I can imagine them scuttling away and hiding in shelter until the rain passes, right? I would think that even being out in the rain and, um, you know, uh, like rain is weather too. Like rain is also beautiful. You hear the sound of, you know, you, 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 you can hear Aule and Manwe together, right? Um, but... Um, Let's make you think more oral tradition. With this exposure to the elements here. Yeah, yeah, but you not so much a library. The yeah. Stories, making right. sure they don't get rock or bookworm. Right, exactly. Exactly. Pretty sure most of their libraries are going to have roofs. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Um, What's Huh. Look at this over here. 
Look at this window right up against the rock with the rock spilling over into the room. Yeah. Uh, what if that came down off the cliff side up there? Maybe. Did That's that fine. shift? What is it? Yeah, it's just like the... Sediment building up? Just like dust blown yeah. by the wind for a couple thousand? Huh. Several thousand years. Yeah. Maybe. It I'm is not... like you could imagine it being blown up against, but it's not really... Huh. It does look pretty solid from out here, but it's also organic. But, you know, knowing the elves, maybe they wanted to make it look organic. Yeah, I mean, that they would have built it like that against the rock. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't shock me. Yeah, you know. I, I think this little dude just got free over here. There's just this little guy next to the The little supplier. boulder kind of rolled in? Yeah. 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 There, it might not look right now like it did when they set it up. Right. Right. Maybe there were carvings. Maybe. Maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's but interesting. We, we've seen how much the mountains have shifted from all of the, the glacial, glacial boulders all over the place. Right. Down below. Exactly. So. Exactly. Presumably longer ago than the Second Age when they set up in here. Okay. So this is up on top of the hill. I don't get it. I haven't gotten a really good lay of the land here in Mirabelle. Um, but then again, I, I never really have, mostly because they put so... This was... This was the endgame area before... Wasn't it? Was this an endgame before area? Moria. Before Moria? Before my time, oddly. Yeah, I'm trying, it was before my time, too. Um, uh, it came out the same uh, time as Moria? Okay. Same time okay. as Moria. Okay. Yeah, you're right, Drosnik. The epic barely comes here, but it's like rammed full of instances, right? It's. I mean, I have to admit, when I first came to Mirabelle, I was really disappointed because it was, uh, you know, it would have been high on my tour list, you know, it was high on my tour list. Like my list of places I wanted to see in Middle Earth was, um, you know, the ruins of like, can we see where Celebrimbor's forges were and all that stuff. And um, yeah. I was disappointed when I first came here and I was like, where's the stuff? You know, um, and it's all in instances is where the stuff is. And I never find. I never find. Archeo gaming inside instances nearly as satisfying as outside. Um, yeah, I, it never I think it is just satisfying. has to do with the library of images. They're just, it's just not. As well, yeah, and they're they're and because it's an instance, there seems to be more of a drive to, um, uh, you know, have to like the outside an instance, the landscape this landscape can serve the story, right? Mm -hmm. Inside an instance, the story the 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 landscape is just like driven by the action right not by the yeah. world building right but by the whatever activities you're needing to perform so like you know if it's like a dungeon crawl or you've got to search for a whole bunch of things or whatever then they make it all labyrinthine and stuff like i'm thinking of course of some particular irregian instances mm -hmm. um but um but yeah there's right. like the gameplay seems to more drive the landscape in yeah, instances, you're, you're whereas it's the world building. Action. Yeah. Well, the world building is more like a, a, a sort of a, a fancy treadmill you're just running. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, I mean, there are some counterexamples of this, but um, it's not. Um, Giant Turtle comes to mind. Giant Turtle that comes had, to mind? That yeah. one had fun. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a few in Moria, too. Moria had really beautiful. World building. Mm. Sorry, just looking at it. The sunrise oh, in various directions. Pretty. Sunrise and moonset. Right. Mm. Um, 
Yeah. All right. So I gotta do. We gotta do. See what we can figure out about the landscape here. What we can get inside of. Um, uh, yeah. All right. Um, so next time. Um, next time we will start exploring more around I think this building is remarkable um, seems to be a gathering place this like so far this is very standard party elf construction right mm -hmm. that is it seems to be built in a very similar spirit to the way that other things have been built across um, across Oregon from Gwingris through the truck stop, tra la 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 land, and on down, you know, the customs uh, area, and now uh, down here uh, to Mirabelle. Um, not, I, I don't see a residence here, right? I don't yeah. see, um, uh, yeah, so I don't see anybody living in this building. Um, this looks like a place where you'd come for parties, and as we can see, it's uh, gorgeous for, like, sunset, sunrise, right? You know, it's mm -hmm. going to be lots of great views, at lots of points, um, in, uh, uh, in up here, you know, from this site, from this beautiful open, um, open hall, um, open above and open to the sides. Perfect for wedding receptions to us. Totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> probably, uh, probably booked out for a long time for that reason. Um, Pons. but we, um, We'll have to look at the rest of the town and see if we can find differences, um, uh, see if we can begin to kind of understand the layout a little bit. Um, but, um, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, but I should also let folks go because it's late again. But we're almost done with the poem. So we're, soon we're going to be returning to my normal, strict discipline about ending class on time. That's totally, that's totally going to happen. So thanks, everybody, for joining us this week. We'll come back to Mirabelle next time. Um, of course, I'm in no rush because <laughs> we started doing an Oregon. We haven't even gotten to Oregon yet. We still haven't left Rivendell, right? Uh, so, uh, um, you know, plenty of time, plenty of time yeah. to explore Mirabelle here. Um, but thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, and I'll see you guys either uh, tomorrow night for... Um, uh, Nature of Middle Earth class, or I'll see you guys next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye now.